Even men at the top of their game find themselves wanting more from life, whether it's more meaning, unshakable confidence, a bigger impact, more money, deeper love, a hotter sex life, or a powerful legacy. Find out how good your life can be on this episode of Man Alive. Also, did you know there's a skill many men never learn that ends up seriously limiting your professional success and satisfaction in your love and sex life? I put together a free guide to explain this unknown skill and give you exactly what you need to use it today. Get it by heading over to shanajamescoaching.com or text the word ALIVE, A-L-I-V-E, to 44144. That's 44144. You'll also get access to Man Alive outtakes, raw footage, and bonus videos you can only get there. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Man Alive. I'm here today with Paul Zelizer. Paul, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's such an honor to be here, Shannon. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm glad to have you. Paul considers himself, um, I don't know if you would say considers yourself, your, your title, right, is Founder and Chief Entrepreneurial Activist. And for those of you who don't know, Paul, I want to give you an intro as we dive in to the topic of bringing business and mindfulness and impact, social impact together. So Paul is one of the first business and marketing coaches to focus on the needs of conscious entrepreneurs and social impact businesses. He also works with leaders to help them increase the transformational impact they have in their organizations and in the world. And he's the former director of social media for Wisdom 2.0, which is one of the premier mindfulness brands in the world. In 2017, he founded Awarepreneurs because he kept getting the feedback that it was time for a community that leverages the power of the intersection of conscious business, social impact, and awareness practices. So Paul, thank you for, you know, being someone who has your, um, your foot in all of these worlds and is actually bringing them together so that people can bring these parts together in ourselves and actually be more of service in the world through work, which is, you know, where we tend to spend a lot of time. In the modern economy, Shana, most of us spend more of our waking hours in our work world than with our spouse or partner or than with our children. We were talking about your son before we turned on the recording, right? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I love my friends. I love my girlfriend. I love my daughter. Um, I love my community. And I spend more time working than with any other individual. And I work less than many Americans do. Right. So mindfulness teachers or spiritual teachers will have told us throughout the generations that what we do with our attention, it's our most precious resource. And if we're spending the majority of our waking hours working as modern adults in modern economy, I just saw an incredible opportunity and, and a lot of suffering that when our work doesn't align with our values, there's just a poignancy there just by the sheer volume of attention, our precious resource not being used in a way that serves our values. The yes. specific kind of suffering there is something that I know personally and before I did the work that I do now and um, just felt an incredible calling to try to find some way to be helpful there. Mm, yeah. And I'd love to hear a little bit personally what drove you to this. And I, I love how you just said it, you know, work that aligns with our values, because there are a lot of people out there. And, and this isn't necessarily a bad thing that some people are working to what there's like the live to work and work to live, right? Or this way that some people work and they don't need it to be very fulfilling. They, you know, that it, it allows them to do other things in their lives. But like you said, more and more, we're spending more time at work and more time in this aspect of our lives. And so starting to align our values with the work we do, I think is becoming more important. So you said before you do what you do now, you were struggling in that way. I'm curious, you know, that the personal part that drove you to create Awarepreneurs. Hmm. Well, there's, there's my personal journey and then there's the journey of watching my parents. So I'll go back. If you want to get really personal about it, we can go yeah. back to about nine years old, 10 years old when my dad, who was an accountant at the time for a large tobacco company, 
was, and this was in the 70s when um, we had data that uh, tobacco companies, it just started to break in the news mm. that um, cigarette companies were hiding uh, data that smoking causes cancer. Huh. And it was a Saturday morning and it was tax season. And my dad, you know, was, we lived in the suburbs and he was putting on his suit and tie. And I, I, I didn't have a vocabulary at that point, but I was like, dad, wh- why do you have to wear a suit and tie? Right. Mm-hmm. My 10 year old brain trying to wrap my head around complicated things that I didn't have language for. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said to me, you know, when you're older, you'll have to wear a suit and tie too. Right. <laughs> And at nine or 10 years old, I was like, in, I don't remember if I said it out loud or if it was more of an internal no, but there was this hell no <laughs> <laughs> at nine or 10, like, uh, uh, like I didn't understand what was happening there. And I, you know, cause the, it was just such a, but I knew that there was something really off and, and, huh. and um, in comparison, my mom, you know, went back to school and got a master's degree in counseling and um, launched her own business and taught workshops on effective communication and mm. leadership development and in developing intuition. And she just seemed to be having a whole lot more. <laughs> and you're done. Time she retired, she had a six-figure business doing this work. So, so it was modeled to me. And, and, and my dad eventually left that work and created work that was very, very powerful for him. But mm. this has been a lifelong journey for me, and particularly for men, seeing the dilemma many men face between earning a good livelihood and trying to find some, at least do no harm version of our work. And some of us, myself included, can't just not do harm. Right. Um, I just am compelled. It's part of my lineage uh, as a kind of social justice oriented Jew. That's that's my lineage. <laughs> I just can't not think about is this making the world a better place in at least some way. I'm just wired that way. And when I try to do work that doesn't answer that question, yes, I get miserable. <laughs> right. Well, I love that you're bringing it into you know, there, there are some women listening to this, but it's primarily men. And I love that you're bringing it into that because I think there has been a particular pressure on men who historically have been more the breadwinners and that's changing these days and has changed. But, you know, there are a lot of men who have sacrificed uh, their own personal fulfillment or being able to have a positive impact on the world to put food on the table and, you know, be the breadwinner. And there's been a lot of pressures. And so, I appreciate that you're bringing it back to the possibility, right? The potential that men can actually have more than just having to slog through their days. Um, Yeah. Thank you. I'm not a good slogger. (laughs) Yeah. Right. And that sounds like it's worked for you in a way that it's, it's kept you from settling or kept you from choosing to, to slog. It, it, the, the two biggest, well, three biggest teachers in my life have been parenting, relationship, and work. And uh, uh, any one of them, you know, I like to joke about parenting is the personal development, the biggest personal development course you never knew you signed up for. <laughs> um, entrepreneurship. It's only 20, 30, 50 years long. Yeah, I don't know. My daughter's turning 18 in a month. And yeah, it's been the most powerful, you know, experience of my life. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurship is in that category. I didn't go to school for entrepreneurship. I um, uh, trained as an awareness-based counselor. I went to school for those of your listeners who know the frame of mindfulness. I studied in an awareness-based counseling program at Lesley University in Cambridge. I started in 1989. Mm-hmm. And uh, one direction was John Kabat-Zinn, the founder of Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. And he was the mentor for many of my professors in that program. And another direction was Herbert Benson, who wrote the book, The Relaxation Response. Um, one of the f- real significant uh, research-based uh, If you ever use the word mind-body connection, you're standing on Herbert Benson's shoulders Mm, in any sort of scientific way. And then Joan Borisenko, who was at MIT at that time, um, 
Herbert Benson was at Harvard and Joan Borisenko was at MIT looking at women and behavioral health, mindfulness, and emotional intelligence. So it was, uh, this was in Boston and like I said, 1989. And um, that, that was my training. I, I, I knew what I felt called to. I was aware of the research even back then. I wanted to get more informed and learn how people were using these practices to help um, people make significant changes. And this was way before the day that Google was teaching mindfulness and emotional intelligence. Right, in way so before, yeah. Way before Time Magazine had the mindfulness revolution cover in 2014, I believe, right? Yep. Um, this, is, this is the professional foundation that I've been rooted in since 1989. And I just knew there was something there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so you knew there was something there. And then how did you actually come to transition into, you know, working with Wisdom 2.0 and being an entrepreneur and social media? And how did you tie all of that together? Uh, Synchronicity and serendipity. Um, So for, you know, I moved to New Mexico after grad school in 1993. And I was licensed or I was trained as a basically a in counseling psychology. So I was licensed as a community mental health counselor. So I worked in community mental health for 15 years. Mm-hmm. And I was sort of known as um, New Mexico is the, uh, has the largest proportion of people of color in the country. We are, quote, the first majority minority state. Interesting. Our large Hispanic or Latino and uh, indigenous populations. Mm-hmm. And I was working in communities doing incredible work, like bringing together awareness of, you know, um, like restorative justice and bringing community together to work on uh, difficult problems that travel through generations like violence and substance abuse. It was incredible work, uh, but it was also hard work. New Mexico is one of the poorest states we change places with places like Mississippi and Alabama. Are we number 50 or number 49 or number 48 on any given uh, economically and in in other social indicators? Um, So there's, it's a beautiful place, New Mexico, but there's also a lot of trauma here and a lot of struggle here. And after about 10 years, I started burning out. I got tired, but I was, I I started learning about coaching and entrepreneurship in the sector and people teaching mindfulness for a living. But I realized that you have to market it and um, be an entrepreneur to do that work. And I was, this is, I mean, this is a prime moment, right? This is one of those, one of the shifts of when you're doing a certain kind of work and you've been doing it for a long time and then you start to burn out or you start to have a vision and then all of a sudden you realize, oh no, if I'm going to do that, right, I, I have to be able to sell myself or I have yes. to be able to, to get this out there, become more visible. Yes. And I was terrified because I had a master's degree in counseling. I, I knew a lot about research about you know, the human nervous system and what motivates us and what change process looks like. I knew nothing about business or <laughs> technology or any of that. So um, it took me a while and it took some things falling apart. A marriage fell apart. A nonprofit that I had started fa- fell apart. It was like I, uh, I was holding off a call that the universe puts out. And if anybody is listening to the show and you know, um, you've had a moment of where like there's a deep calling and you're afraid and you let that fear lead for too long. Sometimes the, however this works, the volume gets turned up. So the volume got turned up in my life and it happened that a friend of mine was also going through a very similar situation. We both lived in New Mexico. His name is Soren Gord Hammer and Soren is the founder of Wisdom Mm 2.0. We used to live across a horse pasture from each other and our kids would walk (laughs) across that horse pasture and play with each other. Um, And uh, we both wound up needing to, he got divorced. Uh, <laughs> I got divorced. His work fell apart. My work fell apart. We wow. both needed to reinvent ourselves. And um, yeah, I could say that, you know, it hasn't been a linear history, but right. in some ways, you know, the rest is history. Soren started Wisdom 2.0. I went back to my mindfulness um, roots to help people think about making lasting change using mindfulness as a tool. We both got online, got on Twitter when 
very few people knew what Twitter was, especially mm -hmm. Mexico. And suddenly we were at Google learning about search inside yourself before there was a book or anybody, you know, most people knew about it. We were at right. Zappos talking to Tony Shea on the day that Zappos was handing out t-shirts to their employees saying, thank you for making us a billion dollar a year company. Two guys from New Mexico who lived in very humble situations were wow. in conversation with, you know, Tony Shea and his leadership team about positive psychology and creating mindful cultures in a billion dollar a year company. Okay. So, and I want to go too fast over this because, um, you know, A, I think this is part of the journey, right? Oftentimes things fall apart before something new comes together. And I almost made a joke like, oh, right. It didn't just happen. Just, you know, you didn't just fall into this without, <laughs> without falling apart because I think it can seem from the outside to so many people, like you see someone who's successful at something and it seems like, oh, they just, you know, made their way there nice and easy. And so, you know, the, the reality of it, I'm grateful for you sharing. And how did you end up in front of those people and in those, you know, very big, very prestigious companies? What, for me, technology is a, um, it's a complicated um, feature in our life. And if we're willing to use it with awareness and the desire to be in both deep service, um, Tony talked a lot about the book uh, From Good to Great. If anybody is a business person and you want to understand about how to move in a direction that has bigger impact, it was it's a fascinating book. And really the main thing you need to know is they just crunched a whole bunch of data um, looking for, they didn't go in with a hypothesis. They were looking for real world examples of what made certain business, you know, they, Coke and Pepsi as an example. Coke year after year, decade after decade outperforms just sheerly financially Pepsi, um, even though they both sell similar products. Right. So they crunched a bunch of data like that. They picked two companies, one good, one great, and they tried to understand what was the difference. And the single biggest difference after lots of computer crunch time <laughs> running a bunch of numbers is what they call type five leadership, which is having an awareness of something that's larger than ourself. Mm. So if we're willing to, at least in our case, both Soren and I, each in different ways, started showing up in conversations where people who are looking to be part of something larger than ourselves, and particularly how we can use think of wisdom 2.0 the intersection of wisdom practices you know whatever they might be i'm not interested in the brand i'm not attached whether you're a you know meditation from a buddhist or mindfulness perspective or some people in my network are real huge fans of richard mm -hmm. Rohr and contemplative christianity and some people are really passionate about women's spirituality or yoga i, I don't really care what the practice is but we have data about what certain kinds of awareness practices do and how they impact our ability to serve something larger than ourselves. And if we, at least in my case, um, are open to the possibility of using technology to connect with people all over the world, um, interesting things can happen. And that's been my journey when I finally stopped having this story that I couldn't possibly be a business person, I couldn't possibly market anything because poor me, I'm just a counselor, right? And just was willing to enter into meaningful conversations with some very smart people. It turned out that they weren't judging me about what I didn't know. They were listening for, am I willing to be part of a conversation that's larger than myself? And it turns out I had some data. At that time, I had, you know, like 13 years, 15 years, no, like 18 years mm -hmm. of experience and research-based information about how humans change using these practices right at the time that there was a global kind of firestorm of interest in understanding these practices better. So mm -hmm. I had research in mindfulness and awareness based change processes and suddenly found myself in conversations with people like the then chief technology officer of Twitter who was a mindfulness guy and he would say, what do you know about mindfulness? And I would share some things and I'd say, what can you tell me about using Twitter to like build community and grow a business? And he would tell me. <laughs> right? So I was, amazing. Really, I was really surprised at the how deep dialogue and that willingness to 
be part of something that's larger than ourself really um, change the trajectory of my life. Mm. I love I love knowing more about you because you know I've been working with Paul as a business coach for I don't know maybe six months I can't even remember it could be could be less it could be a little more, um, but yeah I I didn't know all of this about your own history um, and I'm curious right uh, uh, kind of moving along in the journey. Um, what what is an awarepreneur, right? It sounds like bringing awareness practices um, and the intersection of technology, you're finding, right, that these interesting things happen. But yeah, give us a little bit more of a sense of what is an awarepreneur and then 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 I'll wait for my next question. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, Shane, I just want to say it's been an honor to work with you. And thank, mm, you thank you. Um, well, the... the the mission of awarepreneurs, we really have, it's the intersection of three things. It's conscious business. So we, you could think about that as values-driven business. Mm -hmm. Conscious business, social impact. How are we impacting the communities and, you know, all our relations is a frame in some indigenous communities, yes. right? Both the human and the animal and the the, the living biosphere that keeps us alive and feeds us and the water that we all drink and the air that we breathe, right? The, the impact on that level and then awareness practices. So if you look at those three things, conscious business, social impact, and awareness practices, there's an incredible poignancy, entrepreneurship, and whether you work I don't really care whether you own your own business to any of the listeners here, whether you work in a company that has, you know, 50,000 employees or mm -hmm. 20, you know, 2 million employees or you're a solopreneur working at home in a spare bedroom. I don't care. What I care about is, are you thinking like a social entrepreneur? Are you like saying, this is my job description. You know, I only do my job. Like I just like go through the transactional process. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, but I'm not so interested in talking to that person. Because mm, how does a social entrepreneur think? Social entrepreneur is saying, this is given the resources that I have, right? Rather than like, I need a grant, I need a I need permission from so and so to do something different. Social entrepreneurs are constantly innovating, not just for their own well being. I'm good making money. I'm good with whatever your goals are. I have my own goals of you know what I'm working on just financially. But the primary motivator for me and most of the people in my network is what's we're living in an incredibly poignant time on planet earth what yes. are innovative approaches using the resources we already have I'm talking to people who work in some of the world's least developed economies in haiti or afghanistan or, you know and even there there are people using a social enterprise mindset to make profound positive changes mm -hmm. with the resources that are already around them, many of them being human capital relationships in communities and leveraging them not to like, like strip the commons of whatever's there to, you know, for only for their own self gain, but to say, hey, given the resources that we have in this community that I care about, online or off, one city, a region, a state, a country, here's what we can do to use the resources we have to make this corner of our community a better place. That's mm. what social entrepreneurs do. I love it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. And so I think I kind of interrupted. That was um, part of this, you know, you were talking about uh, the intersection right, of conscious business, social impact, and awareness practices. Yeah. So you talked about the conscious business and social impact part of it. And then awareness practices, it's not, it, in some ways, it's much easier and and some people just seem to be wired this way. I kind of wish I was one of them. <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. You know, hey Paul, here's your job, here's your job description, here's your computer, <laughs> here's your here's the you know deliverables or the metrics we're gonna measure you by. And like go off and program this code or put in this data or like cook these, bake these cakes or build this building. And know when they're done and, and have you it. You know when it's done <laughs> and like 
you like that's your job and someone else yeah. kind of mostly defines it for you and you might say oh there's a little bit you know maybe we could do it this way in this sequence rather than that sequence but mostly you're there to fill a role that somebody else defines and your job is to be efficient and um, to the best you can contribute to the productivity of your own contribution to the company and the team you work for. Mm-hmm. And that's a beautiful role to play, but it's not my role to play. Yeah. And it's not the role to play of um, the people that I work with best and the people on my network. If you're somebody who is an innovator and you're somebody who's thinking about hard problems and how to make um, progress, it's stressful. Um, we were talking about we turned on the record before we turned on the recording, Shana. It's like, wow, there's just a lot going on in humanity right now. <laughs> and to show up and care, and, and not only care, but actually be, I don't know, motivated or stupid enough about that. <laughs> it's, it's not easy, especially if that's not just a thought you've had this week or last week, but in my case, my career started in 1988 and, and, you know, I started as a social worker, as a social work intern. Actually, I started at 17 as a volunteer in 1985 in a drug and alcohol for teens, right? So you get a little sense. This isn't something that I just woke up last week and said, you know, there's a lot of problems on the planet. I wonder if I could do anything about it. I've literally not been able to not think about this. I'm right. just wired this way. And, if and you're I still- love that. You're right. I was going to say that's, that's something that probably, you know, someone listening, you could relate to. There's something that's been on your mind and on your heart, you know, for years or decades yeah. and actually starting to realize, okay, I can make this a bigger part of my life. I can, I can either shift my work or shift my my life to start to have attention to solve these hard problems. And awareness practice, as we now know, can really help mm-hmm. both in on, on so many levels. One is to work with some of the the stress of dealing with hard problems and showing up in those hard conversations that are related. You know, hard problems are hard partially because they're sticky. They're, they're not, it's not usually as simple to make changes. There's usually multiple factors, some of them that have been going on for generations. Right, right, right. And so we're sitting in the face of oftentimes trauma and not as much resources and structural inequality issues, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. So the stress, um, awareness practices, they call it mindfulness-based stress reduction for a reason. They help us with that stress. Two is they help us access our creative thinking. There's a reason that Google teaches mindfulness and emotional intelligence. Part of it is they want their employees to be less stressed, but we know now that these practices help us access our more creative thinking. And we, if we can have even simple, like one minute a day of some sort of awareness practice, wow. a little bit of yoga, right? Even one minute a day. Even one minute a day. If anybody wants research, we can talk about that. Yeah, well. we, can, we can find, we can dig that up. That's incredible, actually, to realize, okay, one minute a day or three minutes a day or five minutes a day, that it could be that small of a change yeah. for a big impact. So that's the awareness practice part of it, that having some simple practice that we do on an ongoing basis deepens our ability to affect change, allows us to show up through time in the conversations where there are multiple factors, and allows us to bring a sense of creative or innovative thinking that allows us to go deeper below what's already been tried and find new solutions that actually work. Mm, I love that. Okay, so now you have a person who either is an awarepreneur or an inspire in in what was what's the word? Um, aspiring. <laughs> You're say aspiring. Inspiring. There you go. <laughs> I was like, that's not right. An aspiring awarepreneur. And what, what's the next step, right? Like, what is it that you're supporting people to do? I mean, clearly to have more of these awareness practices, to be more conscious, I guess maybe even the bigger question for me is how do you take someone who wants to be more conscious in their business, 
you know, is starting to have some experience or knowledge of awareness practices, the social impact piece to me seems like, I don't know, maybe that uh, this seems like it could be the more challenging part, but I'm not sure. Have you found that one is more challenging than another? And how you how do you get people into all three? Mm, that's a great question, Jen. I would say that different people have different challenges. Some people are just oriented or come from a background where social impact is just the norm. It's just what you do in this family or this community right. or this church or this tradition. Um, there's other people like awareness practices. They've just been doing them for decades. This is what, like at this point, I started with awareness practices in my teens when I got out of balance and out of control with substances, with drugs and alcohol. And at uh, 17 years old, awareness practice, a very wise woman said to me, look, Paul, you're wired for poignant experiences. This goes mm -hmm. one of two ways. You're either going to have a lifetime of addiction and drama and probably an early death, or you, there's these great things called wow. practices and you can have a great life and really help people and that desire for depth can not only take you to incredible places but you'll help others along the way i don't Woo. care which path you choose but i hope you choose the latter path of awareness practice well that is some serious laying down some wisdom she got my attention because she wasn't trying to like promote me, uh, I'm sorry, promote her brand. Like you should go right. to such and such church. You need to do this. She just said, there's this thing called awareness practices. And I really hope you check it out. It does a powerful thing for somebody who's wired like you are. Yes. No judgment, no push, just like this is the real, real. And I heard her and, and I've never stopped. Um, yeah. So some of us, you know, some of us have just, we've really cultivated our business acumen. I mean, really cultivated it and have thought about values in business, but the whole idea of social impact or deepening it through awareness practices, that's very new for. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, there's three doorways and most of us will enter in one. And then if we come through one, the invitation is, if you, at least my invitation is, there's a possibility to have a much greater impact than any one of them alone if we're willing to look at the intersection. Right, and to develop the others. And I'm seeing, oh, right, it's probably just my own lens to see, oh, social impact probably is the, the lesser developed of those three for me that would have me say, oh, you know, it seems like social impact would be the more challenging one, but right, that's, that's my worldview. Well, think of the gym, right? Somebody might be a super bendy, flexible yoga person and they've got the flexibility thing down, right? Yeah, like yeah. head on knee, but like strength there, it's not their thing. Somebody else might compete in strong men or strong women competitions and lifting incredible amounts of weight, but they're really tight and their concern is flexibility and agility. And if they don't work on it, they're likely as they age to get hurt because, mm -hmm. you know, they have injuries because our muscles are, you know, not designed to be that tight, right? So you think of a very physical analogy like that and you think of fitness or, you know, an endurance athlete, a runner who, again, maybe never stretches and um, gets into their 40s and is suddenly dealing with all sorts of problems because mm -hmm. they never thought about flexibility and alignment issues. They just thought, hey, I just got to run the miles and they did some damage to themselves and it would really serve them well to learn about foam rollers or do some yoga or something like that. <laughs> right. 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 Okay. Great. Um, yeah. I think the, the thing that I'm sitting with in this moment, as I hear about all these three different doorways, right, is thinking about a man who wants to have a bigger impact in the world or a, a more positive impact in the world and also wants to be more fulfilled, right? This is not about, I don't think, um, more self-sacrifice to get to the point of, you know, so, so many of the men I work with and so many of the men I think who are drawn to me are kind and generous and heartfelt and have been taking care of people their whole lives. And so I'm wondering if you see a path to have a bigger impact and also be more personally fulfilled at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. In that type five leadership, being part of something bigger than yourself is for me those are peak experiences they're not always easy but there is something that happens when we're expressing our daily life energy in service to that 
that is not like anything else I've ever experienced. Mm. And if somebody were to say, well, how do I go from where I am? Like, I want yeah. that. Some yeah. part of me wants that. And I don't know how to get there. The, the, I'm thinking a lot about dialogue these days. Who are we talking to? And what's the focus of our conversation? If you change the conversation, there's something really powerful that happens. As a matter of fact, one of the things we just launched with Awarepreneurs, is we just announced this last week, is something called the Awarepreneurs Podcast Network. I am a huge fan. I'm so honored to be on your podcast. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of podcasting. It's portable. It's free. You can listen in the car, at the gym. We have listeners in Scotland who walk on the beach and people in Africa. And it, like, it's such an incredible opportunity to invite dialogue into our life. And the second podcast, we're starting something called a podcast network, which will ultimately be about 15 different podcasts, all looking at different aspects of this intersection that I just told you about. Wow. The very second podcast we launched in the Awarepreneurs Podcast Network is called Dialogue Lab. And it's um, hosted by a friend and a colleague of mine named Reva Padwarton. Dialogue Lab, it's called? Dialogue Lab. Yeah, dialoguelab.org is Reva's site. And we're so honored and proud and uh, just in a space of awe that Reva would say yes to being the second podcast in the Awarepreneurs Podcast Network. That if we, that in many work environments, there's a limitation in any of these three, you know, how can we bring more values to the business conversation in many work environments or even in a lot of entrepreneurial circles? It's just like get out there and hustle and make the sales goals or, you know, work on these metrics that you've defined. And, and I'm not opposed to those metrics, but in those environments, it's hard to kind of deepen down and find what is that really crisp, really powerful expression of your values so that you can be more attentive to that, right? Similarly with the social impact, there's whole structures that are starting to get more visible. We can look at some of the conversations that women are having about how men have treated women in work environments and the Me Too movement and others, that there are structural things that have been in the way of really honest dialogue, conversation about racism and white supremacy is like just blowing up, even in the business world. Um, it's, it's just, there have been by design certain conversations that in the work world are, we haven't had containers for. It's part mm -hmm. of the reason I'm so excited about <laughs> Rava's podcast, right? Um, finding places where we can enter into the dialogues that are really on our growing edge and that we feel supported and met and have thought partnership rather than people who have quick and easy answers. People mm -hmm. that, that was how Soren and I got started. We got on Twitter and we started talking and suddenly we were talking to Tony Shea and the leadership team wow. <laughs> and people at Google, right? Yeah. Um, really honest dialogue without an immediate quick return of like, oh, this is going to make me, you know, X amount of dollars in the next 30 days, stepping out of that transactional reality, going into the dialogues that where am I particularly being invited to look at being part of something larger than myself? Who's having the, the real dialogues, the mm. ones that are peeling back past where there's been either conscious or unconscious sort of what were those things on the old cars i think they were called regulators so that the big <laughs> v8 engines didn't go too fast right yeah, there's right. been there's been societal regulators about how deep we go in certain conversations and if you can find spaces and i do that a lot with clients it's part of what we do with the wearpreneurs we have hundreds of members around the world in a very affordable membership community is we try to create that partnership in a way that we're allowing the dialogue to go into places where in the past people have been afraid to go. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Right. And I could see, you know, for one person to actually start to follow those 
inclinations, those hopes, those dreams, those heartfelt, you know, memories from being a child. And, you know, and I can even see in my own history, even just in the past month of getting really caught up and doing a lot of work and, you know, it's good work in a way and it's work I love, but it's not, uh, I shouldn't say it's not allowed. I can see my tendency to get swept up and then get disconnected from that deeper place of, okay, how can I continue to have a bigger impact or a a more positive impact or how can I continue to, um, you know, to grow in a way that's, that's in service. So, you know, I can see the, um, the whirlpool in a way that for most people and in the world where business is taking our attention and the political situation and the environmental situation and, you know, my, my um, invitation to you listening is to use this as a call into that deeper place in your heart, you know, into that call, into that quieter place that you find as you become more mindful and more aware um, and see, you know, see what's there. And, and I'm curious, Paul, what, what you want to leave people with, you know, where they can find you, but also what are some, some parting words you want to leave people with for now? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. I so appreciate it. Mm, I love that you were here. And yeah, the invitation is to to follow the threads of curiosity about what are the what are the dialogues, what are the inquiries that your heart of hearts, whatever that language is for you, that your heart of hearts is inviting you into, and to notice. Are the people who are currently in your world, are they meeting you there? Are they enriching that dialogue? Does it feel like even if it's not intended, there's ways that you're getting subtle cues, like don't go there? Like, Are you being met in that desire? Because I trust that desire. And Mm -hmm. a huge part of the past 10, 12 years has been coming out of my own fear and following that thread in my life and then creating communities and helping people find communities, even if they have nothing to do with communities that I am part of, where that is allowed and encouraged. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you for your inspiration and thank you for the the life experience and for the courage to make the changes and, um, you know, and, and the, the generosity I felt in you from the first moment of meeting and your, your willingness to have your attention on people and communities and, you know, see what's needed and called for and, and answer that call. So thank you for being here and, and for what you're up to in the world. Again, it's an honor to be here, and thanks for what you're up to, Shana. I got to interview you for the Awarepreneurs podcast. Yes. <laughs> such an honor to find out more about your work with men and how you approach it and relationships. And Thank I just, you. I love what you're up to. Mm, thank you. I'm so glad you joined us for today's episode of Man Alive. I hope it gives you a sense of what's possible and how good your life can be. If you like what you heard, I'd be so grateful for you to subscribe to Man Alive and write a quick review that helps men like you find us. And again, head over to shanajamescoaching.com slash manalive to get outtakes, videos, and raw footage I only share there. These are some of the most interesting parts of these expert conversations. You can also grab your copy of The Unknown Power to accelerate your career and solidify your confidence with women because the two are related and I know you don't have to settle for one or the other. Join us each week for a new episode of Man Alive.